In the late 19th century, Emperor Johannes IV ascended to the throne of Ethiopia, becoming a formidable leader and defender of his beloved nation. His reign, from 1872 to 1889, was marked by a series of military challenges as he fended off threats from Egypt, Italy, and the Sudanese Mahdists. Born as Casa Mercha, Johannes IV originally held the title of De Jazmach, or Earl of Tigray. Following the death of Emperor Tewodros, Johannes claimed the Ethiopian throne in 1872, facing resistance from his rival, Menelik II, the King of Shua. Despite their differences, Johannes and Menelik arranged a dynastic marriage between their families, establishing an agreement that Menelik would succeed Johannes as emperor. Their spheres of influence were defined, with Menelik controlling the south and Johannes ruling the north. Johannes embarked on a progressive agenda, aiming to centralize power and reduce the influence of regional nobles. He also sought to unify his subjects through enforced conversion to the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, a move that faced resistance from Muslims who opposed the religious impositions. Johannes's reign was characterized by continuous military threats. In 1875 and 1876, he successfully repelled Egyptian advances, defeating them at the battles of Gundat and Gura. These victories not only secured Ethiopian territory, but also provided Johannes with captured weaponry, equipping his army with modern firepower. In 1885, Italy occupied the Red Sea port of Massawa and expanded inland toward Tigray. Johannes met this aggression head on, decisively defeating the Italians at the Battle of Dogali in 1887 sending a strong message that Ethiopia would not be conquered. As the Islamic revivalist dervishes gained ground in the Sudan, they invaded Ethiopia, devastating the ancient capital of Gondar. Johannes fiercely fought against the dervishes, displaying his military prowess once again. Tragically, Johannes IV met his end at the Battle of Matema in March 1889 as he valiantly defended his nation against the dervishes. His untimely demise marked the end of a remarkable era in Ethiopian history. Emperor Johannes IV's legacy lives on as a symbol of courage, resilience, and unwavering dedication to the sovereignty of Ethiopia. His military victories and progressive reforms laid the foundation for future leaders, most notably his successor, Emperor Menelik II. Following Johannes' death, Menelik II ascended to the throne as the Emperor of Ethiopia. He carried forward Johannes's vision for a unified and independent Ethiopia, solidifying his control over the south and expanding his influence across the country. At Emperor Menelik II pursued a policy of modernization and territorial expansion, successfully resisting Italian colonial aggression and expanding Ethiopian territories. The combined efforts of Emperor Johannes IV and Emperor Menelik II safeguarded Ethiopia's independence and left a lasting impact on its history. Their commitment to preserving Ethiopian culture, defending against external threats, and fostering internal development set the stage for the country's future growth and resilience. Common knowledge of Ethiopia's historical feats is largely limited to the Italo-Ethiopian War. And while this conflict was indeed a significant one for securing her independence, there are many other wars and battles that occurred before Adwa that were arguably just as important, among them being the seldom talked about battles of Gura and Gandat, part of the Egyptian-Ethiopian War. In this mini-series, I will be giving a breakdown of the situation leading up to these battles, the battles themselves, and their immediate impacts on the political situation in North Africa and the Horn.
The political landscape in the Horn of Africa by the 1870s was pretty messy. The Egyptians, in the 1860s, had achieved virtual independence from the Ottomans, and were busy securing control over the ports of Misawa and Arkiko while planning on expanding further on the Horn of Africa, to secure control over the ancient Red Sea trade, which was becoming increasingly valuable with the opening of the Suez Canal. Furthermore, the Egyptians, under previous leaders such as Muhammad Ali, not the boxer, had already expressed interest in expanding and conquering the entirety of the Nile Valley, which really only put them on a crash course to conflict with the Ethiopians. Ethiopia, on the other hand, was still under a long process of reunification, only recently had a hundred years of feudal warfare been ended by Tuodros II, and even his reign quickly ended in the redivision of Ethiopia. The next emperor to take his place, Johannes, managed to quickly overtake his enemies and rivals and consolidate control over most of Ethiopia, excluding Shewa, which continued to largely function as an independent state under a man named Menelik. The Ethiopians had already dealt with Egyptian and Ottoman raids throughout the century, but these conflicts usually only amounted to border raids, which often resulted in the capture of women and resources, but nothing much more particularly hot grounds for fighting being at Bogos and Matema. These small skirmishes were about to escalate to full-scale war. By the early 1870s, the Egyptians had already made plays to try to bait Ethiopia into a war. Werner Musinger, a Swiss man the Egyptians appointed to control their port at Massawa, had occupied the Ethiopian province of Bogos. But the Ethiopians wisely did not take the bait, Johannes instead preferring to turn his interests inwards to deal with some rebellions. The Egyptians attempted another plot to take control of key salt mines in Ethiopia, but were stopped after a British soldier in the service of the Ethiopians, J.C. Kirkham, was sent to ask the British for help. While no help was directly given to the Ethiopians, the British did manage to temporarily deter the Egyptians, who they held strong amounts of influence over. This peace didn't last very long though, and after Musinger was promoted to control over other territories, his replacement, Arakil Bey, told the Egyptians that he believed that all that was needed to conquer Ethiopia were 3,000 to 4,000 well-armed men. After a failed attempt to encourage the ruler of Shewa, Menelik II, to engage in a two-front war with Emperor Johannes, the Egyptians decided to deploy anyway, and in October of 1875, began by launching four forces deeper into the Horn of Africa, of which only two are relevant to this video. The two important forces were led by Musinger and Arakil Bey. Sources differ on where exactly Musinger was planning to go. Gondor, Shewa, and Somali territory all seem to be possibilities. Either way, he was stationed at Tadjura port before deployment. Arakil Bey, accompanied by Colonel Ahrendrup, a Danish man in the service of the Egyptians, was set to deploy from Massawa, and it's definite that Arakil was planning on conquering Ethiopia. Johannes, on the other hand, had a much more difficult time gathering an army. Many of the Ethiopian nobility did not respond to his call for war. Johannes did, however, manage to get the attention of Shalaka Alula, and also mobilized Walda Mikael Solomon, governor of Hamasien. The Egyptian forces led by Arikel Bey set to fight Johannes was composed of infantry and artillery units equipped with Remington rifles and mountain guns. Multiple American and European commanders accompanied this force, and commanded their own men. This force totaled about 2,500 to 3,000 men. Musinger's force was equipped in a similar manner, and appears to have been composed of 2,000 or 3,000 troops, numbers vary. The Ethiopians, on the other hand, were equipped with a myriad of weapons, including guns of varying quality, swords, and spears. Approximately one-third to one-fifth of the Ethiopians were equipped with smoothbore muskets, though some lucky ones managed to get their hands on Snyder's or Remington rifles instead. Finding estimates on the size of this army is hard, the only one that I could find saying that there were about 70,000 men. But this seems unlikely, especially considering that most of Johannes' troops for this battle came from Tigray and Hamasien. 
Shalaka Alula would command 1,000 men himself. So before we go any further, I do need to clarify that these sources are a bit conflicting on the specifics of what happened. So this is sort of me trying to logic my way through everything. Some of these conclusions are my own. So I fully recommend that you guys also go through the sources and reach your own conclusions. Muzinger's force of 2,000 men was ambushed while headed inland sometime in November 1875. Many sources claiming that this force was slain nearly to a man by the forces of Sultan Muhammad of the Elsa Sultanate. One source claims that this was motivated by a feud between the families of the Sultan and the wife of Muzinger, while another claims that the Elsa Sultan attacked in retaliation to Egyptian expansion to their ports in order to retain control of their land. Both of these sources may be incorrect though, and it's possible that this conflict will be discussed further in a later video. The ambush of Muzinger left just Arikil's force, who had begun marching inland on October 2nd, headed towards the very important town of Adwa. The Ethiopians would delay their reaction, gathering their own force on October 23rd. En route to Adwa, the Egyptians would drive back a small Ethiopian force stationed north of the Mareb River on November 6th. It appears that when the Egyptians finally arrived at their location, they formed two separate camps, one at Adikwala and one at Gundat. By the 14th of November, Shalaka Alula's force of 1,000 troops crossed the Mareb River and engaged in a skirmish against an Egyptian force of about 600 men led by Count Ziki brother of the Austrian ambassador to Constantinople. The next night, Johannes moved his main force across the Mareb River. Ahrendrup, hearing of Ziki's confrontation with Alula's force, would march eight companies, or about 800 men, four pieces of artillery, and two rocket stands down to the Mareb River Valley, where they engaged Johannes' force and were crushed. Ahrendrup and Ziki were both killed during these engagements. Finally, a force under the command of Arikil Bey moved in, and quickly became entrapped on the mountainside and valley. Shalaka Alula's force had moved in from a western flank to the Egyptian rear, blocking them off from retreat, and the Egyptian army was devastated. The Egyptians would suffer a total 1,800 deaths, including Arikil Bey, Ahrendrup, and Count Ziki. The Ethiopians would only suffer about 500 dead and 400 wounded, among them being Shalaka Alula's brother, who would heal from his injuries. The Egyptians had been caught completely off guard by the ability of the Ethiopian army. The army that they expected to be exclusively armed with spears appears to have had access to numerous guns as well, and as a result, the Egyptians were unable to overwhelm them with the technological advantage that they thought they had. This was further compounded by the inept commanding of Ariko and Ahrendrup, in comparison to the skillful maneuvering of Alula and the large force of Johannes. Egypt's Khedive, Ismail Pasha, was infuriated by this loss and wasn't having any of it. Despite peace offers from Johannes, he decided that he needed to succeed in his conquest of Ethiopia, and would deploy a much larger secondary force to do just that.